I'm Nicholas Burling. This is Tri-Cities Community TV, and I'm joined by Rob Bottas, a council candidate for Coquitlam, for a conversation on housing affordability. So, Rob, you've been one of the most outspoken candidates on housing affordability that I've come across. Can you explain why this is an issue that you're really passionate about? Um, first of all, thank you for having me here today and giving me an opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you for and joining. It's, it's great to see you again, by the way. Um, you as well. Enjoyed getting to know you on the 2018 campaign. <laughs> yes. But as for housing, I got to tell you, um, I came at it from a bit of a, bit of a self interest because when I was a, I was a renter, renter for most of my life, and when I saw the Austin Heights, when they started redeveloping the Austin Heights area, I looked at what could potentially happen to me as a renter that I could be priced out of my community. And then when I started looking for places where I could rent that I could afford, it was very challenging. So I have a bit of self-interest, but I also have empathy for others because if I'm struggling, I know that there's others struggling out there as well. Um, I was fortunate in that I was able to purchase a home in 2012, but there are many out there that are not able to purchase a home. And if, we, if they want to be able to continue to contribute to our community, affordable housing is a key part of their ability to remain in community and contribute to our wonderful community. Absolutely. We, we live in a very similar neighborhood and, and I also you bought just, my place around the same time. So Just down the block from me. Absolutely. I know how much the rents have gone up since we both bought and, and uh, it, it's hard to imagine how some people would afford to live in this city these days. Um, is the issue of housing affordability as important in this election as it was in 2018 when we ran? I think it is because if, if anything, despite what the city and the city of Coquitlam, they are building um, lots of housing. But if you don't build the right kind of housing, I don't. You can't just build yourself out of a out of a housing affordability crisis. You have to build the right kinds of housing, which is why our housing needs assessment should be at the forefront of any decisions that a council is making. Maybe um, you want to expand on what the right kind of housing would look like in so, Coquitlam. Yeah, the right. I mean, but oh, sorry, is housing affordability as important? Yes, it is. But you can't just look at housing affordability within a microcosm. You have to look at, there's other aspects like affordable communities, livable, work, walkable communities. Do you have the jobs in the community that, that will allow people to earn enough money to afford the housing in their community? Um, you look at, in 2016, the census identified that 75% of our residents are commuting elsewhere for work. That's more congestion. That's more money they're spending on, on commuting. That's less time with their families. That's more impact on their mental health. If we have, whereas Metro Vancouver, in the same time frame, only 22% of the residents are commuting outside of their regions or communities for work. So if we can, first of all, reduce the commute times, our residents are gonna have more money in their pockets to either spend in the community or go towards rent. That is, that is part of the affordability. It's, there's a whole, it's a, it's a complex issue. Right, and it seems um, like that's it, intertwined it, it, with environmentalism it as is well. It is, as well. But I do think, um, People are looking at it in a better light. They're looking at it. it's not just affordable housing. It's all the aspects that, that can contribute to that. So you've got to look at, you know, are we creating good paying jobs in the community? Um, are we reducing people's commute times? It's, it's not just affordable housing, but, but the, as, in, as in terms of the right kinds of housing, um, you know, we do need market rate. I mean, there are going to people that are going to want to build luxury developments, but we also need market rentals, we need non-market, we need below market, we need co-ops, we need rent to own projects. There's many aspects of that. And we have to make sure that we're building homes for both seniors, families, youth, and the marginalized in our community. We know that within the next nine years, the seniors population in Coquitlam will be 19% of our population. And if we're not building the kinds of, and I've been talking to many seniors as I've been door knocking, and lots of them are living in their homes by themselves. Well, if, they, if, if we had housing for them to transition into, that's a house that could be potentially back on the market for a family or a group of, or a group of young people to rent. You know, but it, so unless we solve the bottlenecks, we're not going to solve the affordability problem. Also as well, like, you know, we have 30-30 Gordon for those that are trying to transition out of homelessness. But once they're in 30-30 Gordon, there's nowhere to transition to, you know, because you can't just go from 30-30 Gordon to market rate rental. Mm -hmm. You need to go, I mean, just as prisoners released from jail go to halfway homes to then get the skills to integrate back into community. You can't just go from being homeless to a shelter to market rate. There has to be a component where you transition into so that you can, so you can get back on your feet so you have, a, you have a greater chance of succeeding as opposed to failing and becoming homeless again. Right, and so you're throwing out these terms like market and below market, non-market. Can you maybe explain what the difference is between a below market rental and an affordable rental? Well, 
CMHC defines affordable rental as no more than 30% of your income before taxes. Um, Non-market is obviously going to mean you're not going to mean you, you won't you don't have the 30 you know you don't have the 30 percent maybe you've got the 25 percent your rent is geared to your income and but we also know that those that are on social assistance um the the shelter rates have not kept pace with what's going on in the market i mean rentals price of housing but also rentals have detached themselves from people's ability to earn and unless you can solve that problem it's gonna it's only going to get worse mm -hmm. you know um Right now in Coquitlam, we know that 72% of our households owners, 28% of our, of our community are renters. But of that 28% are renters, 35% are in core housing need. Either So that means they're spending more than 30% of their income on rent. And, and within that, um, I said 35%, right? I believe so. Okay, sorry. Numbers aren't always my best thing. <laughs> And but there's also within that there's also those in core in extreme core housing need, which means they're spending more than 50% of their income on rent, as compared to owners. 11% of owners in Coquitlam are in core housing need. Um, and the funny part is like so in 2021 the overall population in core housing need was 18%, and that's a blend of renters and owners in our community. Uh, by 2031, that's going to drop to 17.9% not much of an improvement we need we need to square that circle and because when you're in core housing need you're in greater risk of becoming homeless and of course when, when you're homeless you know crime rates go up not to say that all homeless are criminals because they aren't but you have a greater incidence of crime or crime against the homeless you have great you mean then of course people can fall into drug addiction and mental illness as well and that just creates more costs for a community that you know if we can if we can house people first that's going to save us money in the long run so that we can focus on infrastructure, um, supports, amenities, parks in our community. Mm -hmm. And do you see uh, mandated percentages of affordable units as being one solution to this issue? I know Coquitlam, they like to use um, incentives as opposed to the stick. Um, I think in some cases, I mean, like if a person's putting in a luxury tower and that, and that is their business model, well, no, having a minimum percentage of market or below market units, that's not going to work for that developer. It's probably going to piss that developer off. I think you have to find a way to work with the developers because they are, they are a component of creating housing. In fact, more housing is created by developers than it's created by government in our community. But if you can't have a healthy partnership where you can discuss stuff and share your vision of community, you're not going to get a lot of work done. And if you take an antagonistic approach with developers, I think will be I think will be harder to get work done than it is if you're in a a collegial relationship, so mm -hmm. to speak. And one of the issues that I've been hearing quite a lot from residents is that we have these older buildings in the city that will get torn down. You'll see a new tower in their place, and the idea is that you replace those older units, which are you know going to be lower cost just by nature of being an older building with a newer building that includes below market units, with the idea being that those people who are in that older building will now be able to live in a below market unit in theory. But those below market units are significantly more expensive than the market rate units in the older building. How do you solve that issue? I'll be honest, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm willing to have the conversation. I'm willing to look, to look because, I mean, it's easy to sit on the outside of council criticizing. Not having been in the inner circle with the discussions, with the meetings, you know, there, I knew I have a lot to learn, but I'm willing to learn. But also, I will continue to use my voice to advocate for complete, inclusive communities. All my life, I've advocated for an inclusive community in Coquitlam, and that inclusive community has people from all walks of life, all types of ability, and all types of income ranges. That is a true community. A true, com you know, you don't have haves and have-nots. You don't. You don't. Uh, you got. It's we're everybody. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and I know that this I is a, yeah, and this is a fairly big issue. I think in our neighborhood specifically, we have some older apartment buildings in the my, area. My building is uh, nineteen. It's close to forty-two years old, and your buildings. Your building was built in nineteen seventies, if I recall. Nineteen seventy-two. Yeah, mm -hmm. our buildings are getting towards end of life. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of seniors in our building that are concerned that yeah. if this, you know, if the city rezones or a developer comes in and wants to buy mm -hmm. out the building. Where are they going to move? Because they're not going to be able to afford a unit in whatever no, exactly. replaces their building. And I mean, I think you know there's there's a huge opportunity for developers to earn goodwill. You know, if you do the right thing, it's okay to make profit, but it's also okay, okay to make a little less profit 
because you can't put a dollar value on the goodwill you will earn in the community if you help preserve communities. Like uh, back in 20, back in 2020, I was actually approached about a project that was being put forward by the Affordable Housing Society. Now they're a not-for-profit society. They own their property over on Azada Avenue. Um, I took a look at it and they were gonna go from I think 32 townhouses to I think six stories. They were gonna create 135 units. And unlike some developers, who just relocate people out of the community, Ozada Avenue committed to A, helping their tenants relocate. They offered, they offered superior relocation packages. They also committed though, that those, same, those tenants that left are able to come back into the building at the same rent adjusted for inflation, which is, I mean, whereas when you see developers replacing a rental unit with a market rate development, those, those renters that have been relocated have an option to come back in and buy a unit which is totally unrealistic because you're a renter for a reason. You're a renter because most renters are renters because they can't afford to buy. So giving a renter the option to come back in and buy a unit doesn't really do that renter much good. So I was really impressed with what the Affordable Housing Society did for their residents at Ozada Avenue. You know, they, they took, they did the right thing and we need to get more developers doing the right thing in our community mm -hmm. and, not, and not forcing people out of the community. Right. Um, and can you think of any zoning changes that you would like to see that might incentivize the creation of, of more affordable units in the city? Well, part of it, I mean, one of the reasons Osada Avenue got their project done is they own the land. So they didn't have to purchase the land. So if you have to purchase the land, it's going to make things difficult because with land values being inflated. But also, though, I mean, you see some developers in Vancouver, they'll, they, they'll get affordable units in because they put in poor doors. You know, the, whereas the, so th those in the non-market units have a, less access to amenities. Um, that is not how you create a community of people. And I'm actually pleased to see that so far, City of Coquitlam has pushed back against four doors, because that's not how that's not how you create community. You don't marginalize or isolate those that don't ha that don't have the same finances as you. Um, that's just not it's not a good way to do it. Um, I do think the city could potentially look at what lands do they have, like can the city donate any of the lands that they have to allow a not-for-profit to then come in and build a development such as what the Affordable Housing Society did at over on Ozada Avenue. Um, I know we, we, have the, we have the ability to create rental-only legislation. Um, I know so far that our city council has pushed back against that. I'm still learning about it. I mean, because the, one of the things right now is developers and, and those that want to build rental properties, they go through the same capitalization process. You're a developer, you're going to get back your investment almost right away by through your pre-sales. You're a renter, that's a long, you're a, a, an owner of a rental building, that's a long-term investment, and yet you have to go through the same capitalization. That change can only come though from the federal government because they regulate how the banking industry works in our country. And uh, I think that's something that really has to be looked at because you can't expect them, you can't have them on the same playing field if they're not, because then it, it makes it that much more difficult because to get that affordable rental if they have to go through the same capitalization process. Mm -hmm. Well, and with regard to zoning too, I think about the, the towers, again, coming back to where we live that, that you know, are being put in uh, by the Safeway on Austin Street. And those, from my understanding, were capped based on stories, right? The city said you can build a 25 story building here as opposed to saying this is the height limit, you know, you can only build up to this height. And in doing that, in my mind, it, it probably incentivizes a developer to go, okay, well, we want to maximize our profits. Let's put taller ceilings in these buildings if we can only have 25 stories. Do you see something like that as being a, a useful change where you'd cap it by height instead of stories? And that was one of the questions I got in my survey that I'm still, and I'm gonna be honest, I don't know enough about the specifics of that. Um, it sounds like that could be an answer, but I, I want to look at it myself. And I know that sounds like a politician deflecting, but in my case, I'm actually being genuine. I don't know enough about that, but I'm willing to learn and, and hear what the industry has to say, but also hear what those in our, in our building um, department have to say about that, because what I don't know, I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, I think it's important for politicians to just say, I don't know, as opposed to you know trying to answer a question if, if they don't know what that answer is. So thank you for that. Um, I have a, a question about a specific location. Robert Nicklin Place has received $46.1 million from the federal government, $8.1 million from the provincial government, uh, as well as $102,000 uh, annual operating subsidy from the provincial government, and $3.3 .3 million from the city of Coquitlam to provide 164 units of low-income uh, housing for fa or 
housing for low-income families. Do you think that something like that is a good use of our taxpayer dollars? Totally. Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a we have a housing affordability sh fund for a reason to create affordable housing within our community. Um, and if developers don't want to, I, well, I'm pretty sure you were at that public hearing where that developer that over on uh, North Road and Foster, um, they're like, yeah, we didn't want to access it. Mm -hmm. And city council in unison, they took that developer to task and rightly so. You're going to come into our community. You have to work with us. And if you take the attitude that I just want to build luxury, that's, that's not what we need. We need a mix of housing and work with us. Don't alienate people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it's, I mean, I actually haven't heard of this project. It sounds very, it sounds interesting. And, uh, but at the same time, um, both federal and provincial have to be consistent in stepping up. If city of Coquitlam finds projects that are worthy of funding, that funding then has to come through from the federal government. We, we had a case where there was a, a, a project over on Rochester Avenue where originally the developer was going to have a certain number of rent to own units. Well, the, when they heard from the government, sorry, this was from the federal government, the federal government wasn't offering them um, an interest rate that would allow the developer to make what they felt they needed. So, that, so they, they turned around and now it's all just 100%, you've got to buy it, no, no option to rent to own. Mm -hmm. you know, so we had an opportunity to create, to create a unique housing development, but our partners in the federal government didn't come through for us. Right. Uh, so another question I have is, uh, Hunter Madsen and Benjamin Perry have been looking into developer donations and, and sort of the perceived influence that they might have over elected politicians. Do you see there being a conflict of interest when a politician accepts money from individuals who are associated with developers? I think, well, right now, it is legal. Just, mm -hmm. just as, you know, um, purchasing cannabis in is legal. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't want developers or an individual who is a developer to donate any of their money, then they need to change the legislation. I can tell you right now, I mean, because if you have all, if all nine people on council have all received $1,200 from a developer, should all nine people recuse themselves from that vote? I mean, I think you, you can't just look at, you have to look at the context, the details. Whereas if, if there's a counselor who has $20,000 of donations and one has $1,200 in donations, I mean, maybe that counselor with a $20,000 donation, maybe they should. But I honestly do not believe though that people allow their integrity to, to be bought. I mean, I know with myself, up till now, I have not received any money from developers. It's been a real challenge to raise money for my campaign, but I've, I've worked at it. Uh, I spent very wisely, but I can also tell you, anyone who knows me, um, my Irish half is a little bit stubborn. My integrity can't be bought. You know, if, if you give me money towards my campaign, thank you very much. Thank you for helping enrich our democratic process. But I'm going to look at your project just as favorably or disfavorably as I will look at every other project. I will not um, be influenced by no matter what you've given me because I have to be, make good decisions for the community as a whole. And if I'm making decisions for only a small part of the community because someone's giving me money, well, that, that is, that's, that's a conflict of interest. It's poor integrity and we, we need people that of high integrity in government. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if people are struggling, I mean, if you want to get robust, diverse candidates, we have to look at it, you know, how, how do we do that? How, because let's face it, those that make $120,000 a year or more in their jobs have an easier time of raising money as opposed to a candidate who might make only $40,000 a year. I mean, I, I'm sure it would be lovely to see some single moms on social assistance running for city council, mm -hmm. but the odds of that ever happening under our present funding system, it's not going to happen. Right, and that, that's kind of where my question lies, is whether the, the system that we currently have is working well or whether there needs to be some change, because I think you'll find every single politician that get, gets asked this question will say, well, of course I'm not going to let money influence my vote, but statistically speaking, we know that that's not true. So, you know, to, it's not necessarily that there is a definite conflict of interest that exists, but there's that perception from the public's mm -hmm. mind that if you're taking money from a developer, you're going to potentially view their development more favorably. So, you know, maybe there needs to be uh, declarations from candidates. If, if every candidate has received money from the developer, obviously they can't all recuse themselves, but maybe they need to all tell the public, we've received money from yeah. this developer, just so you're aware. There's nothing wrong with transparency. But also, the sad part in our society is that, is that perception has become reality. You're accused, you're guilty. Mm -hmm. And then later on down the line, they find out you're innocent. Well, your reputation's always, already been ruined because the way our media, negativity sells. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring more positivity back 
to government, to our community, because you engage people and you keep people engaged by creating a positive environment. But yes, transparency would help. Also how we fund campaigns would help. But we also have to remember there's only one taxpayer, you, me, person next door, we've got three levels of government all wanting our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And we can, you know, you can only pay so much. Right. But we, but we do have to find a way, if we can solve how campaign financing is done, we will get more candidates involved, and I think you will get a better quality of candidate at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there anything else that you think the city should be doing to make housing more affordable for renters? Or for anyone? Um, yeah, they, 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 I think what you also need, and I, I kind of alluded this to my interview with We've Got Issues, you have to have a unified vision of what constitutes affordability. And that vision not only has to be shared by, your, by the nine people at the council table, that vision must be shared from your, your city manager all the way down to the person who's delivering your garbage that works for the city. You need a shared vision. And when you have that shared vision, we're working in concert and developers see that. And they, I think they will wanna work with people who actually have a true shared vision mm -hmm. of what constitutes an affordable, inclusive community. Because if you don't have that vision, you're working at loggerheads with, with each other. I mean, you, like each community has, each community seems to have their own de definition of what constitutes affordable. Well, there's only one definition of affordable, 30%. But until every council says that, it, it's just, I don't know. And, and do you think that's an accurate, like, do you think 30% is where that definition should lie? Um, it, well, that's what CMHC has. And until such time as they change that, that's the numbers, we, that's the numbers the banking industry looks like. When you go to, when you go to qualify for a mortgage, they look at what, Oh, well, you know, you're, you're spending way too much over, we're not going to give you a mortgage because you're spending more than your income that you presently have on rent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that 30% is good enough for the banks to determine if you qualify a mortgage, then we should be using that same number for people to afford to get rentals in our community. Yeah, I, I sort of wonder because, you know, 30% of your income looks very different if you're making, you know, $30,000 versus if you're making a million dollars, right? Maybe we need to look at how much expendable money do you have after you've paid for your, your housing. So that's where that question lies. I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to look at it. Yeah. Because <laughs> trust me, I, it's been a struggle to be in community my entire life. You know, I kind of felt like I've been on the outside looking in. Um, I have an opportunity this October 15th to join that decision-making process and hopefully bring some of my lived experience to that discussion and hopefully shape better policy in our community. But that can only happen though if you're willing to have, willing to work with people. If you're at loggerheads, if you see people as the enemy, you're gonna be isolated, you're gonna be ostracized and nothing's going to get done. And that's one of the things I like about the civic level is that we don't have parties. You know, you, it's gonna take five councillors to get together to get something passed. You know, I look at the silliness in Ottawa and what happens in our provincial legislatures, and I, it's, it, I, it's like, no wonder people don't want to get involved, because they, they, they just want to get stuff done. They want good community. Mm -hmm. they don't, I mean, when you, the minute you make something a partisan issue, it becomes about politics. It doesn't become about policy anymore. Right, so we need independent ca candidates who are willing to collaborate with each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. Well, collaborate and work consensus. Right. We're, because if you're in an echo chamber of if you're if you're running if, if you have a slate running the table you're only going to hear people that have basically the same ideas as you you need to hear different viewpoints different life experiences and that's how you get good decisions mm -hmm. so that those are all of the questions that I had for you is there anything else that you wanted to mention about housing affordability before we wrap things up yeah I mean one thing right right now I, I sorry I, I did talk about it. so you get 30 30 Gordon there's nowhere from the go like right now in Coquitlam yeah, we have nowhere. There is no actual transitional housing. So for those leaving 3030 Gordon, the only hope of affordability for them is either illegal housing, um, unsafe housing, or unhealthy housing are their only affordable options. And that is not a recipe for success in our community. And um, I know in, 20, in 2018, I was perceived as a one issue candidate. Um, housing is very important, but there's so many other issues that contribute to, to allowing for affordable housing. And I'd like to think my platform addresses that this time around. Um, I've learned a lot in these last four years. I know I have lots more to learn, but I'm looking forward to working with who's ever on council and serving this great community of ours. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I think this has been a really interesting conversation. I appreciate I always, your work on the issue. Sorry, um, I, don't, I shouldn't, I've been told, Listen twice, talk <laughs> once. Um, I've always enjoyed our conversation, Nicola. I think you bring a lot of you bring a lot of perspective to our community, and I think thank you for doing this today. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this has been Tri Cities Community TV uh, with a conversation on housing affordability. I'm Nicola Sperling, and I'll see you in the next one.